Good afternoon. If I have this right, we are live with the uh, most recent College of Research Libraries online forum. Our topic today, the future of research in the Association of College of Research Libraries. Where do we go from here? I am Scott Walter. I'm the editor of College and Research Libraries, and I was the moderator for a session that we uh, put together for the National Conference in Portland earlier this year, where we engaged the same question, what is the role of ACRO in promoting research skills and research programs among its membership? So we began the conversation in Portland about the future role of the association, and we wanted to take the opportunity to use the online forum to both continue that discussion uh, to introduce the discussion for those of you who were not able to join us in Portland because of the bevy of programs that were available at that time, and maybe to ask some new questions about, again, where do we go from here? What can the association do in the coming years, not just to uh, strengthen the research programs that it has available, but also maybe to think about new ways as uh, research becomes a skill that is necessary for all academic librarians, as research and research skills become more and more intertwined with assessment activities that are more and more part of all of our jobs, how can our association uh, build the connections, build the programs that are going to allow people to be uh, vibrant researchers, both for the traditional purposes of discovery of new knowledge and presentation and publication, but also for these emergent and continually growing needs for research-based assessment activities that can inform and improve practice. So with that as a very broad introduction of what we would like to talk about with you today, let me introduce our two panelists. We have from the University of Alberta, Denise Kupergianakis, who is Collections and Acquisitions Coordinator at the UA Libraries. And we have Megan Oakleaf, Associate Professor in the iSchool at Syracuse University. Both Denise and Megan joined us for the panel program at Portland, and I want to thank them again for extending their contribution to that program by joining us for the online forum today. With that, I'm going to uh, begin by asking a question of the panelists, but I will also ask that uh, Sarah put our slide up on the screen. This slide will provide you with all the information that you need in order to uh, contribute to the discussion. So whether or not you want to send us a question for the panelists by Twitter, whether or not you want to post it on Facebook, uh, there is also a web form that is available to you. And uh, as you see that uh, information come up, please do take note and feel free to tweet us or web form us or Facebook us uh, or do whatever you like to get your question to the panelists. Let me begin by a question, uh, with a question that I think is near and dear to all of our hearts, and that's LIS education. Um, research skills and the place of uh, research training in the pre-service LIS, LIS education program is something that many of us have talked about um, many times over the years. But uh, the question that I would like to pose uh, to our panelists is how can ACRL collaborate with LIS programs, not to suggest what LIS programs should be doing, but rather to look at how the association and its uh, capacities for continuing professional education can uh, come together with LIS programs and their capacity both for pre-service and continuing professional education uh, in order to come up with a real uh, lifelong vision 
of research skills training that takes you from your first day in library school all the way into your initial uh, position, your mid-career, and so on. How do we take a lifelong view of research skills training and education in the field? I'll invite either one of you to pick up on that. <laughs> Okay, well, I'll, Denise, you want me to take a crack at it? I will. Okay, yeah. so um, uh, I'll start. Um, most of you, um, or some of you may know that I, I work in LIS education, so I'm actually not sure that I'm the best person to give uh, the first response to this, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a shot at it. Um, so this is Megan Oakley. I'm a LIS educator. I work at Syracuse University in the School of Information Studies. Um, I'm also a research and author. I do consulting and training uh, with in-service librarians and also obviously teach pre-service librarians. So um, very, very invested and embedded in LIS education. Uh, the first thing I wanted to say is that I do think that there, Scott was being kind about saying ACRL doesn't necessarily need to suggest to LIS programs what they need to be doing. I'm just going to go ahead and take my privilege as an LIS leader to say, that that would be welcome, uh, at least um, from from myself and, and my colleagues here. I think that it's easy, um, as hard as you try to stay connected to practice, to get a little bit separated from it. So direct communication from people, uh, members of ACRL, as well as the leadership structure there, uh, would would be, I think, um, actually appropriate in many cases. Uh, but I also think that there's, like as Scott said, lots of opportunities for collaboration. Um, you know, the, the main drivers of change in LIS curriculum um, are probably not very surprising to any of you. Uh, one would be accreditation. So all LIS programs obviously need to maintain their uh, ALA accreditation. And so those standards that dictate accreditation are a very big deal to us. Um, also standards that the associations, various associations within ALA and others um, are a big deal when we sit down to revise curriculum. For example, there's currently an ACRL task force um, to uh, outline competencies for assessment related uh, librarianship positions, both coordinators and assessment skills that all librarians should have. And so when that's finished, that would be a document that would uh, be part of this picture particularly from the assessment perspective, but uh, other areas as well. So that's a, that's a big motivator and driver of LIS curriculum reform. Um, the other, or one of the other sort of big three in driving LIS um, curriculum reform, as I said, accreditation, other kinds of standards and documents put out by our library professions. The third are job descriptions. So not surprisingly, in a professional program, uh, students expect to get professional jobs when they complete it. And so what libraries ask for in their job descriptions gets a great deal of attention in helping us try to prepare people for those jobs. And sometimes I think that they, you know, some, some things about um, what we need to change and improve and augment the profession become sort of self-fulfilling or cyclical in that um, we don't necessarily have strengths in all areas. So those areas aren't, people don't necessarily ask for the job descriptions because they don't want to describe a superhero candidate that doesn't exist. And then those skills don't get required and then we don't pay um, them due attention. That makes sense. So including those things when you want those skills, those research skills in, you know, regular types of librarian positions as well as uh, librarian positions that would focus on this more exclusively really, really necessary. But then on top of that, on top of the ways of getting some of the attention of LIS educators, um, I think oh, definitely there should be um, developed more models that align the projects that Denise and Scott are going to talk about, um, the immersion program that ACRL provides, things that those sorts of models more in conjunction with LIS programs that could start by partnerships where there are LIS schools and universities, uh, university libraries, college libraries that are at those institutions, 
but that's pretty limited since there aren't that many LIS programs. So, you know, a more a, a broader perspective of ways that we can come together around those training opportunities, those professional development opportunities. I've said before that I think one of the things that ACRL does best is professional development, um, and we're supposed to be developing professionals, so it seems like there would be a natural synergy around there. However, oftentimes that is not the case. So those are, those are some of my initial thoughts on that. Um, OK, I'll just jump in. And um, to follow on from what um, Megan has already mentioned, um, I think that at the core of it all, we need to talk more between the um, LIS schools and practitioners. And I think that ACRL as a body can perhaps represent to the schools um, some of what may be needed in terms of those emerging trends, the things that the faculty want to know about and look for so that they can ensure that students are given the best education. But then uh, looking ahead for those um, librarians that are already working in the field as practitioners, um, thinking about that lifelong learning component that Scott mentioned, um, I think that, you know, the reality is that when you're a student, maybe the research methods course doesn't really necessarily sink in because, you know, it's not your immediate need at the time or you can't directly relate it to what you're doing in your practice as an academic librarian or a future academic librarian. Um, so I think that um, partnering uh, with the library schools to provide that ongoing education in terms of research methods could be really valuable because then it becomes more at the point of need when um, librarians are working, they're seeing that they need to do some research maybe for tenure and promotion, or they just want to because that's an interest and they think it's something they should be contributing to our field. And so I think there's a lot of ways that the uh, MLAS uh, faculty and the programs can really assist with this, um, particularly if we look at online education and learning. Um, here at the University of Alberta, our School of Library and Information Studies offers uh, one credit um, continuing education courses which um, are available for students to take as credits um, but also are available to members of the community to further their education um, as well. And so if you take something like that and perhaps apply it to online environment then it could attract a much wider audience and this could be overview of research methods or target in it could be a series targeting various research methods and then attract people who are thinking about using those particular methods as they uh, look to answer their research question. Great. Well, Somebody, thanks. Oh, can I jump back in, Scott? Go ahead. Yeah, so something that Denise said um, uh, encouraged me to think about something else as well. She, Denise was talking about how um, LAS students don't necessarily think, ah, research methods, this will be the thing that I need when they see it on a, a course schedule. I can confirm that that is definitely the case. And so when you offer a course and it doesn't get sufficient enrollment, it sometimes takes a while to re-offer that course. And many programs um, have eliminated research methods from the core over time, uh, based in part of feedback from, from um, uh, library students and sometimes there's other reasons there as well and or have rebranded it under different names so you know trying to hope that a rose will smell sweeter if you don't call it research methods um, so so there's that um, I think that we can some I know our LIS students spend a lot of time working with practitioners interviewing practitioners uh, observing and doing internships hearing from people in the field that that's something they really need would help uh, I know personally, um, in my master's program, it's, it's been a while now, I was required to do a master's paper. I don't think I could have ever gone on to do the research um, that I've, I've enjoyed, uh, certainly not a dissertation, if I hadn't had that first formative experience. I hope, I hope every day that no one finds it and reads it, because it was definitely a learning uh, experience rather than a great piece of scholarship, um, but it really did, did help. So, you know, thinking about those uh, taking on those research projects early in library school as a, as a learning opportunity, really, really critical in, in getting that to be something that students want to take as opposed to being forced to take. So thanks, Denise, for spurring that thought. Great. Thank you both. Let me, uh, let me uh, build on that. 
because what Megan has introduced is the question of our role as uh, LIS uh, practitioners and professionals and the impact that we might have in helping uh, both uh, incoming LIS professionals understand that research skills are important, um, not just for the traditional means um, of presentation and publication, but again, uh, for this notion of using data to inform practice. Let's, I guess I'd like to, to build on that a little bit to, to ask um, what sort of work we can do uh, to help get that message across. What can we do uh, in field experiences or other opportunities that we have in working with future uh, librarians uh, to get them interested and aware of the value of research skills for their work Moreover, is there work to be done in terms of library leadership, uh, in terms of our university librarians, our deans of libraries, uh, in helping uh, get the message out from the leadership level that research skills are a, an important capacity for our libraries to have? Jim Neal, uh, uh, recently retired from Columbia University and one of our panelists at Portland has written uh, persuasively about the notion of the academic library developing an R&D capacity. Well, obviously the R is research. So is there a means by which we might um, engage uh, library leadership, deans, directors, ULs, uh, in, in um, promoting this as something that uh, their librarians should be pursuing and looking for opportunities in? Um, I'll take a crack at that, I guess. Um, I think that it, it maybe starts um, from the, with the association in terms of, of what kinds of language is used around academic librarianship and what it entails and ensuring then that research is a part of that so that as um, new librarians are entering the profession they see that this is something important so that if they want to um, engage in an academic library type of position they need to start thinking about those kinds of skills and what they can then bring to the institution. Um, so yes, definitely having the leaders of our institutions, our deans, um, you know, come out and voice those kinds of things being important, I think should really have an impact. I think that um, there's another side to it as well, which is just the reason that, um, well, the reason that I, for example, do research, which is to hopefully better our profession. So just at the core of uh, trying to have a better evidence base and have this research that we can use to actually show we are a profession and know what we're talking about and what we're doing. Um, so I think um, underlying everything needs to be uh, that concept of research being important to what we do as professionals. I think the movement of evidence-based library and information practice, which I have been a part of for about the past 15 years, um, is kind of now at the point where it's catching on and is being uh, recognized as an important way for academic librarians to approach their practice. And research is one very important piece of that evidence. And so if we know that that's then a way that we are going to be practicing in the future, we need to ensure that librarians entering our profession have those skills. And if they um, have them at least to a certain degree when they're starting, but then as they're entering into new positions, that we mentor those librarians, that we help them along, that we show them what this actually means in terms of doing research while you are a practitioner as well. So um, whatever you know can be done in terms of mentoring, assisting, understanding the kinds of questions and how you go about finding answers to those questions um, and supporting those librarians in gaining those skills so that it's not just about them achieving tenure um, but it's about the, that underlying you know basis of why we're doing what we're doing. 
I want to jump in before Megan before uh, Megan answers, just to underline that notion of why I research, and that is, I think Denise has re you really hit it on the head for me. You know, when I think about why I research, I do research in order to do my job better. I do research in order to ensure that my library is serving its users as effectively as it can be and that these are not just about publishing, it's not just about tenure, it's about being um, what what I and, and others have sometimes called a, a scholarly practitioner. It's about looking at your work with that same degree of rigor uh, that you do when you prepare to publish. I'm going to turn it over to Megan for her response. I also want to remind the audience we are open for your questions. Uh, send them along, web form, Twitter. Um, we're looking forward to hearing uh, some of your questions and your ideas on these topics. Great. So, um, yes, please please do that. And, and we could even put up that slide again, possibly, um, because you don't really need to see me to hear me. Uh, so uh, just, to, just to tack on to that, I mean, I really feel like um, from a UL perspective, I've never been one, but I certainly can imagine um, that that perspective pretty pretty easily. Um, you know, Denise, there's no one who speaks more eloquently about evidence-based librarianship than, than Denise. Um, we really all should be using data-driven decision-making rather than what Jonathan Eldridge outlined at an EBLIP conference years ago, but which really has stuck with me. Um, uh, the, the cognitive biases that he investigated in librarianship and the ways we make decisions when we don't make decisions on data. Uh, so, you know, not every decision has to be made on a full-scale, you know, research project, but some sort of research and understanding the foundations of how research works, how it's driven by questions, uh, what kinds of things are uh, legitimate uh, approaches and methods to a given question, for a given question. Um, all of that is really critical uh, to understand. So if, if, if ULs and, and, and everyone down, you know, from the top to the bottom of the organization need to make decisions as they do on a regular basis, making those decisions based um, not on, on whimsy, faith, hope, or, or anything else. It's really not a, not a, a good plan. Um, you know, having that research focus, that research attitude, that research mentality, looking for, for either research that's done in your own library or places that are similar to your library to be able to make those decisions on, really, really so important. Uh, when Jonathan Eldridge did that study, the the, I think it was the, the primary cognitive bias that he found was, um, he said it in French, but basically it was uh, seeing the world through your own professional lens, just through it as a librarian, uh, which is so dangerous when we don't take the perspective of other people, other the, our stakeholders, our constituents, other, you know, our colleagues that are in other parts of the library, really um, viewing things through lenses other than our own. So that's really a dangerous... Um, basis on which to make decisions, just your own perspective. And research helps you get a clearer picture on that. So I think that's really important. One of the areas in which um, that's, I think, uh, been been the case has been the, the value, the Value of Academic Libraries Initiative, the ACRL, uh, started several years ago, and I was lucky enough to be a part of. Um, you know, really, uh, a university librarian, one of their key jobs is to demonstrate, uh, communicate, for sure, um, and grow the value and impact of their libraries. And without the, the, the data around that f from research, from assessment and other types of research, uh, that's a very difficult thing to do, as I'm sure people know. I also often joke, but it's not really exactly a joke, that um, you know, research can come from really dark places as well. And so uh, I, you know, I think back to Carol Kulthau's information search process. And my favorite step in that process she uh, labels as confusion, frustration, and doubt. And uh, you know, if you're not in encountering confusion and frustration and doubt in your job, you're probably not paying enough attention. Uh, and the way to alleviate those feelings is by delving into um, the evidence, the research, the, the data, so that you can get some clarity. Um, another more colloquial way of putting that, I guess, is sometimes being, being uh, confused or even ticked off. My best research comes from being ticked off about something and wanting to get to the bottom of it. So um, if you've got angry ULs out there, I think that uh, uh, research is a good way to go to, to bring clarity to that and help them make decisions based <laughs> on rational thought rather than like, I'm so angry. Um, so you know, I, I think that, that 
you else really need to both um, encourage but also actively reward the risk taking that's involved in research. Right? So you write a research question, you hope to find a particular, uh, you have in the back of your mind a particular um, you know, result that you maybe in your heart want to find, uh, but you go into it with an open mind and, and using good, good practice. Um, I, how do I want to say this? But I mean, if you don't have those tools, um, if you don't have the resources that you need to pursue that research, uh, then then you're really going to be in a stuck place. If you find out that the result is what you had hoped maybe not to find, you need to be in a safe place where that risk taking will still be valued and rewarded. Um, something that uh, I know a lot of colleagues say is to fail fast in order to succeed sooner. You know, failed research isn't really a, a failed. Uh, uh, project unless you fail to use that information to move forward in a positive way. So, so thinking about how you're going to reward the risks inherent in research is really important. Yeah, we reward successful published research, but even research that turns up, or maybe more so research that turns up that thing we don't want to hear, really needs to be safeguarded and rewarded in, in organizations. And ULs are, are, there's no one in a better spot to, to protect and support that than a university librarian. Let's let's uh, build on that. Uh, a couple of interesting questions uh, related to this, I think, have come uh, up on Twitter in the last couple of minutes uh, that speak to the leadership role. Um, one is the question of structures of support. You were talking about reward, um, but there also is the question of um, mechanisms for uh, supporting librarians doing research. Obviously. Uh, the opportunity to have a continuing professional education opportunity is one such support structure. The opportunity uh, to get professional development funding for uh, participating in those sorts of activities would be another example of, of a commitment the leadership could make in developing skills among its staff. Uh, and of course there are others. Uh, an interesting question was posed, and that was to look at this not just at the individual librarian level, which might be rec uh, in relationship to uh, reward structures or release time or what have you, but to look at the organizational capacity. Uh, a library that had an identified research agenda. We know that in many academic programs there may be uh, areas of research strength that the academic leadership uh, consciously pursues, uh, tries to grow greater strength uh, in order to, to, to bring a critical mass of researchers. What about the idea of a library identifying a particular area within academic librarianship that it would look to grow as an organization uh, to build skills in a particular area, whether that was teaching and learning or uh, digital library development, or you can imagine other sorts of examples. Uh, with, with, well, it's an interesting idea. What do you think of it? Um, yeah, I think I think that's a great idea. I think if all academic libraries um, had those conversations, and I think that it also needs to be um, throughout an organization so that it's not top down. I think if you're telling people they have to do a particular uh, type of research, it's just not going to work very well. I mean, maybe if you're holding a stick over them and they're not going to get tenure or something. But I mean, ultimately, ideally, an organization would, in conjunction maybe with your organizational goals, your plan, um, talk about what do we really need to know, what kinds of areas do we want to be very strong in, and how can we achieve this? How can we work together on particular re research projects and share that outwardly with, with the rest of the community? I also just want to take a step back and relate this back to ACRL uh, as the focus of today's um, discussion. And I think that as a profession, we also need to think about what are the big, the most important questions facing our profession. And um, 
you know, so what are they and how can we go about answering them so that as a profession all academic librarians can benefit. So um, that may be something that ACRL could undertake um, in exploring what are the most important questions facing our profession, um, what evidence uh, in the research literature already exists to help us with that, and then what more do we need? And then outwardly that could um, allow um, teams perhaps of librarians who are interested regardless of where, where they may be in the country to form research groups and work on those kinds of questions together. So it then pairs people together with their interests. Um, it starts to form community um, even though people may be dispersed. They, we, we can do so much online now particularly with research projects and usually if it's beyond your institution all for the better. Um, so I really think that we can head in that direction and as, um, as a side note to that, um, the, the summarization of existing research on particular research questions is also very valuable because it allows practicing librarians to know what the state of the research base is. Um, before they go forward with their own research or their decision making. So doing things like systematic reviews on topics that are important to us. And I'll just note that the Medical Libraries Association is doing this right now. Um, there's a model that can be followed. Um, I can't remember exactly how many teams, but there's maybe 12 or 15 teams of researchers um, who are librarians, medical librarians, working on the topics that the MLA has determined to be of greatest significance to them. I would just like to mention that um, we, we have a, a second a really great um, example of that in the assessment in action project the ACRL has headed up and this we're in our uh, they're in their third year of that. Um, you know they took on uh, many of the questions that um, we either started or continued by the Live Academic Libraries Initiative, but also have reached, you know, beyond that to issues of institutional import importance uh, at these different ins at these different campuses, and have done a great job of really training and bringing together whole campus teams, so a more um, uh, holistic approach uh, to the problem. So I think that's another really great example of where um, ACRL has seen a need responded to it in a variety of different ways. They, you know, the, the, the report, the initiatives, uh, the summit, the assessment in action, the great, you know, continuous grant writing. Um, so there's definitely a, a second model there on top of the MLA example uh, that, that I think is a good one to follow uh, going forward when there's an issue uh, that the whole profession needs to address. And of course they brought that um, out of the concerns of librarians and their in scans and their surveys, so it, they were uh, pulling from the profession to serve the profession, and so I think that's a, a good way to go. Great. Well, um, let's uh, let's move into another area. I'm now looking at some of the questions that have come on through the web web form. I want to thank everybody. Uh, Twitter has has lit up. The web form is picking up, uh, so we're getting some good questions. We will try to get to as many of those questions today as we can, and we will also look to uh, at least summarize in some way. Uh, our discussion today uh, for communication back uh, to ACRL as they think about, again, the future of their programs. I have a question um, from, uh, came through the web form in regards to the role of research for community college libraries and librarians. We all know that, uh, at least in the U.S., a very significant number, I think even the majority of students who are educated uh, in terms of uh, post-secondary education are in community colleges. We also know that many people, uh, again in the U.S. context, uh, will move in and out of four-year and two-year institutions uh, routinely, uh, not just during their traditional uh, years of uh, 18 to 21, but perhaps uh, throughout their lives as they do uh, job retraining and so on. What opportunities might we make available or how might we better integrate the community college experience into these discussions of research skills programs and development? Uh, 
Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I, you know, I um, I work in a large university library, um, so I don't know that I, I feel um, that adequate to answer this question. And I really hope that um, we're not only getting questions from um, those of you listening, but that you send your ideas. And I know Scott was planning to give feedback to ACRL, so we do want to hear from you and your experiences and what you actually, what you think about some of these issues like this question that has just been posed. I guess, um, personally, I think it's important regardless of what um, type of library you work in, although I completely understand that the circumstances are different depending upon what your expectations are and what you can do. I think in all cases it's really important that we try to draw upon research and other forms of evidence to inform our practice. Um, so um, hopefully, you know, really extending that same kind of continuing education opportunity to those who work in community colleges um, would be great. I mean, we're all of the same skill level and have the same, you know, background in education and are trying in the same ways to serve our users um, regardless of our library type. And so it comes down to tailoring things that work for you. Um, and one example may be um, uh, action research led kinds of projects that are very practical on the ground dealing with exactly the issues that you're facing in practice and trying to do that just in a little bit of a more systematic way, tracking um, and uh, reflecting on changes that occur as you, you implement something new um, and integrating that into your practice. It, it occurs to me also, um, so I obviously am not a community college librarian either and so uh, like Denise and Scott, I would like to hear from the from those of you who are listening who do want to speak to that directly, so please chime in. Um, but having said that, um, as a, you know, having crossed into the dark side and, and moved into the faculty role, um, you know, it, it can be very isolating and I'm imagining uh, many community colleges have fewer within library um, colleagues and resources sometimes as, as opposed to a really big organization at a large um, uh, library. Uh, organization and and that's something that is definitely in common with with my experience where you know you're sort of this isolated in some ways person who needs if when you're doing your research oftentimes comes up against something you don't know how to do uh, that you have you know partial thoughts or you need confirmation or you know you want to run this test or take this approach and you just need to bounce ideas off someone or get expert guidance and I think one of the roles of ACRL can be in connecting us with each other um, because we have such a depth of experience across the field but oftentimes we don't know who to ask or who might be willing to offer some advice or support. Certainly we have many professional listservs and other methods of communication that are helpful but ACRL could also uh, take a lead, a, a, a lead in, in helping us connect with each other. Uh, I know in the in the olden days, there was, for example, an expert database with regard to information literacy. I'm not suggesting that same model because I think they just put that to bed. Um, but something like that where we can reach out and, and say, does anyone have any particular expertise in running this type of test or running this kind of focus group or structuring this type of question? I just need someone to bounce my ideas off of because when you're isolated and sometimes small libraries feel uh, can feel isolating, um, you need to have those professional colleagues, which we do as members of this community, but facilitating those connections uh, could be something that ACRL was really critical in helping with. Okay, excellent. Let's, let's talk about facilitating connections. So I know uh, from my own experience, uh, our, our library was part of the Assessment in Action program, and I know that that has been an example of a relatively large-scale uh, research initiative uh, that is coordinated through ACRL that has been inclusive of large research libraries, of, of uh, liberal arts colleges, and of community colleges. So I might throw out there what are other sorts of initiatives like that. I don't expect us to answer that today. But perhaps one approach is to say, 
well, what are some of these big cross-cutting initiatives that, again, if supported at a national level, uh, might bring in uh, pr practitioners from all different library types? But I want to now throw out a, a, a separate question, and that has to do with Megan's idea of, of isolation, uh, which I don't mean in an existential way, but simply uh, that we have talked about what LIS programs can do. Well, as we know, there are only so many LIS programs, and there are online educational opportunities, as Denise noted, but of course, again, there are uh, strengths and, and, and limitations to that. We know that ACRL at a national level can do programming, does do programming, but we also know that it can be a challenge to participate in programs that might be happening across the country or, in Denise's case, in another country uh, to participate. But ACRL does have a network, and that network is called the chapters. And those chapters are physically accessible to a large number of our colleagues. Those chapters are inclusive of all different library types. Is there more? If ACRL is on one level thinking about big national projects like assessment and action, is there also something more that we could do locally? Can we use this existing network of chapters to, uh, to see these skills, to facilitate these connections, uh, and to help people see what the, uh, the value of research is to them uh, on the ground. We haven't really decided any order that we're going in here as we answer these questions, hence the pauses. <laughs> um, so I'll jump in. Um, Scott, I think that's uh, a really great idea um, in terms of using that existing infrastructure of ACRL and um, the chapters in order to facilitate, I think, um, research training needs. Um, so maybe a research in action kind of program or something like that. I think that it's really important that um, this kind of a program ties very directly to what individual librarians are wanting to know, to learn, and to research. So I think it has to be, uh, rather than any kind of, you know, course where you're just theoretically listening and learning about different types of research methods, it's about coming with what your initial question is anyway. Maybe you're going to refine that question over the course of a workshop or something. But coming with something, hey, I have this problem and I want to know more about, you know, this, these are my questions around it. Or, hey, I'm really curious about X, Y, or Z. So start thinking about um, the things that you're interested in researching and bringing uh, one particular thing and having that kind of a group with instructors, people who can kind of tease uh, out of, the participants what they really want to know and then start to connect the dots in terms of okay well what's the best method to help you um, get at what you want to know to answer this kind of question and so I really don't like it when we just um, you know promote or say here's all the different methods because the most critical piece is connecting the question to the method in order to make sure that you can answer it properly and have that understanding and that's crucial it's hard and it takes a lot of time and effort and it's not something that just because we're librarians and we know how to do ref we have reference skills and know how to help people with their questions it, it's I found in every case it, it is much more difficult for us ourselves to figure out how to ask good research questions and then connect that to the best methods to answer them. So I think that having some kind of um, you know, institute or whatever it worked out to be that could 
uh, tackle some of those kinds of perspectives on research. So it's not just about the research methods, but it's connecting all those dots and seeing research as a holistic endeavor, um, the whole cycle of it, and talking through the issues and problems that uh, those in attendance actually face on a day-to-day -day basis, all the barriers that um, you will encounter as a researcher, and giving you strategies in terms of how to overcome some of those barriers and turn what you're doing into a successful event, um, which hopefully makes you love doing research all the more and you will keep doing it and spread that word to other people. Um, so I think what, um, what Scott has suggested is a way to build the con connection within our community and to build teams that can work together um, and uh, help one another through all those kinds of problems that we, we know we all encounter, regardless if you're a new researcher or a seasoned one. Yeah, I, I love, I love, I really like going after Denise because she gives me so many good ideas to uh, spin off of. Um, I think that the, one of the points that she made that was so um, important is the, um, the focus on having a group help you think through the steps of the research process. I, um, as I said at the, at the outset, I, I have the opportunity and I love it to do a lot of training of, um, and consulting with uh, librarians. And one of the things that most surprised me when I started that part of my, um, my career was the difficulty that um, it really, that really shows up when you try to have someone express their problem, question, interest, passion, etc. in the form of a research question. And a research question that doesn't presuppose the answer and that could actually be um, used to structure a research project. That's, um, you know, it's the first step. Uh, and it's, in many cases, the most challenging step because everything else flows from that. And if you get it sort of, you know, not if you, if you write one that's not very clean, you're going to run into problems down the road. So working together with a group that can see the, the, the weaknesses and the strengths of your research question or help you phrase it in the first place, so critical. And then matching that methodology, um, the, the approach that you're going to take with it, making sure you're using the right statistics if that's involved or the right, um, you know, uh, the most effective way of coding something qualitative or whatever, whatever the, the case might be. Um, uh, I, I, I totally uh, support this being a, a chapter uh, of focus thing as one way of making those connections. I also wanted to point out Andrew Asher, a uh, colleague friend, uh, has just uh, recently put on, on the Twitter feed that it's also important to connect with other types of associations outside of what, it, what do you call it, the, the library echo chamber. Um, where we tend to be talking to ourselves. So a lot of the issues that are of concern and interest to librarians are also of concern and interest to others on our campus. So that's one of the power things that's powerful about the Assessment and Action Project is they're team-based um, uh, from not, not just the library but other people on campus. And I think that's true. I mean, the ACRL um, has the liaison program to other uh, higher education focused institutions and we could use those connections in addition to connections within our own profession uh, to, to make the, the conversations around our research richer and also to make sure that we're not just talking to ourselves or, you know, what's the other really, rather unflattering metaphor? Oh, navel-gazing. Yes. So um, I've always disliked that, but I think it, 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 it hits the point squarely on the head right uh, as we're discussing it right now. So um, I think that's also another way in which ACR can connect us with chapters and associations that aren't necessarily just our own profession but others that have the same interests. Very nice. Thanks. Thanks for those connections. Um, we're coming down into the last, you know, 12, 13 minutes of, of the of the session. So I want to make sure everybody has a chance to throw in some questions. And questions have come up on the Twitter feed in, in one way or another as well. So I want to uh, throw out a couple of of uh, comments and, and, and ideas uh, that have come through the Twitter feed. One, uh, Denise, there's a fair bit of interest. Uh, showing through on the systematic reviews project that you mentioned as well as whether or not ACRL might pursue a, a similar uh, approach to that project. Uh, rather than asking you to describe that project, which I'm sure would, would take uh, more time, I'll just note that you know, there's always room for a guest editorial. 
in college and research libraries uh, about how uh, ACRL might uh, move in that direction or learn from the MLA project, so I'll throw that idea out there. But another question that came through was from a new librarian uh, just uh, finding his or her feet and asking, how do you identify a question? How do you get started? How do you think about what are questions worth asking? And another thread coming through on Twitter is also about this notion of meaningful questions. Not necessarily just questions that are relevant to one's practice or to one's job, but meaningful research questions that should be pursued to help us to better understand the foundations of what we do, why we do it, and how and why our organizations perhaps are structured in the way they are. Would you like to spend a, uh, any time talking a little bit about identifying questions and sort of getting your first steps into a research agenda? Well, um, since Denise always has to go first, I'll, I'll, I'll try it this time. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, I think you already uh, touched on a lot of the ways that one gets started with a research agenda, Scott. I mean, you, you, you start from the things that interest you, the problems that you have. Uh, my first uh, research uh, projects were uh, out of frustration that uh, library instruction help didn't help and that um, you know, I disagreed with a, a scaffold approach that some of my colleagues wanted to take because I, I didn't think it would fit the needs of the students and I found out in some cases it would in some cases it wouldn't so it was, it was really a problem or issue related to my personal um, practice and I think that's a fine way to start especially as a, as a, a beginning librarian. Um, I think a lot of those things that are a problem or issue for for one of us or some of us is are are relevant to whole sectors um, of our of our profession and, and and higher education in general. So it's a, I think it's a fine place to begin, um, and you can ex extrapolate out as you get your your sea legs, so to speak. But um, in terms of looking at you know big research agenda, one of the things that you you learn in a research methods course is how to do uh, negative searching, how to find the holes uh, where others um, either haven't been before, uh, sort of Star Trekian, or um, uh, you know where people have have gone but not really fully answered the questions. And we are lucky enough and to be in a profession where not all the questions are answered. So uh, there's plenty of opportunities to, to plug those holes. You know, so I think that the very first thing, once you start to center in on um, an area of interest, wherever that drives from, your ex personal experience, something that's going on at, uh, in your workplace, uh, something you saw at a conference, uh, is to really start looking at the literature. And I think um, frequently uh, people start out without um, doing that adequately so they they reinvent their wheel and spin a little bit before they they get traction and can contribute to the to the larger conversation so using our librarian skills for ourselves and not just for others I think is really critical we tend to serve others better than we do serve ourselves so doing that literature review reaching out through social media phone conversations at conferences networking and being brave and approaching people that you don't already know um, getting the lay of the land is really, really critical in terms of finding those research areas that have legs, that have uh, a, a trajectory that you can make uh, your own or, or, or contribute in meaningful ways to the conversation. Uh, just very quickly, because we don't have a whole lot of time, but I, I just want to say I agree with everything that Megan just uh, noted. Um, and I'll just add one thing, which is I would encourage practitioners to actively reflect on their practice. Um, this is something that might take a little while to get used to doing, and you need to figure out the best way you may want to do it. But, um, for example, keeping a journal or an online blog that could be private to you, or whatever way you might want to do it, and recording your thoughts, things that have come up in your practice, questions that you have related to librarianship, to what you're doing. Um, over time, you'll start to see um, problems, or you'll be writing down your frustrations, as Megan had said, and those kind of things will be the fodder that uh, lead you to 
um, coming up with a good research question. Because what's really most important is you want to tackle something that you have a deep interest in that's going to sustain you over a long period of time. None of this happens very quickly, and you don't want to lose your interest. So finding something that's important to you is um, really, really key. Wonderful. We are just about at time, and so I wanted to end by reiterating this idea of this being a long-term question. We began the panel in Portland by saying, well, ACRL has supported research in some particular ways over its first 75 years. You'll remember it was a 75th anniversary meeting. Where do we go next? If research skills, whether it is for traditional uh, reasons or for the reasons related to assessment or for whatever reason, is now something that we really would love to see all practitioners have. It really opens up a range of questions and uh, some of those questions have appeared on Twitter on our ACRL Research Futures hashtag already today. Um, I, I encourage people to go back and look through that feed if they haven't. Um, but where do we go long term? And again, we don't have an answer for that today, but that's what we would like to present out of these two meetings uh, back to the ACRL board and simply say, there's a need out here. There's an interest out here. There's an interest in doing things potentially in a different way. There's an interest in, in thinking creatively about our partners, whether that be another professional association like MLA uh, or another um, academic uh, scholarly association that may have overlapping interests with ours, whether it's thinking more creatively and in a more long-term way about our partnerships with LIS programs, whether it is thinking uh, more creatively about the way in which we disseminate uh, programming through uh, online means or through the existing network of our chapters. These are all questions that we would just like to put out there and then to see what people are interested in growing for the future. So with that, I am going to sign off, and I'm going to invite both Denise and Megan, in that order, uh, to present any final questions. Denise, I'm going to pop in for a second to say I think your mic is muted. I'm sorry. So I just wanted to say that um, I, I would really encourage everyone um, online and who views uh, the video perhaps later to uh, send in your questions, send in your thoughts around what ACRL can do, and I think that we can really build a stronger community by working together. I, uh, I, I have, have the privilege of getting to agree with both of my colleagues. I think that all of that is true, and I'm so gratified that so many of you have been participating in this conversation. I know it's not always an easy venue to do that, and so I really, really appreciate that, and I hope you'll keep percolating on these thoughts and, and continue to share them. Um, I, I really feel like we have lots of good examples. I, I was just articulating the need to look at the literature, to look at the examples, to look at what's gone before in order to grow and expand on those good ideas and, and learn from the, the not so good ideas as, as a lesson learned. Um, and I think that you know between the examples that came up today and the other ones that we're aware of as a community, um, there, there needs to be sort of a, a systematic review of what kinds of things like this uh, can be effective. What are the steps in the process of collaboratively and individually uh, with help from colleagues um, pursuing a research agenda and having a, an association support that. We have numerous successful examples and, and we really would, would do well to learn from them. So I think that uh, although that's not going to be a project that I research, I think someone really uh, should consider uh, looking at what is effective when it comes to this the MLA project, 
the existing ACRL projects that have been very successful um, over the over the course of ACRL and, and maybe even more so currently. Um, the other types of things that have been showing up on Twitter that where we can learn from our colleagues across the academy. So it doesn't make sense to start from scratch always. Let's let's do let's practice what we preach and and learn from the existing successful uh, collaborations. Wonderful. And with that, we are at time. But this does not need to be the end of the conversation. Uh, we look forward to uh, to talking with you at other conferences, uh, hearing your ideas. We will communicate them, and we will see what grows. Thank you all. Uh, Welcome back from Memorial Day if you're here in the U.S., and welcome back from Monday if you're outside of the U.S. Thank you all. We look forward uh, to continuing this discussion and uh, to future CNRL online forum programs. Thank you all.